If you've spent any time on social media, then chances are you've come across this scathing hot take about Batman. Oh, well, if Bruce Wayne did more for charity and spent his Batman money helping people, there wouldn't be a need for Batman. They even reference this in The Flash, and while it was a funny scene, it just doesn't ring true to me, especially for the DC Animated Universe version of Batman that we see in Batman the Animated Series. I would argue that the BTAS version of Batman is the definitive Batman. Yes, I think that he's even better than the comic book version. There are lots of different versions of the character, from the goofy Adam West Batman through to Frank Miller's anti-establishment anarchist Batman from the Dark Knight universe. And as Batmite, voiced by the late Paul Rubin, said in Batman Brave and the Bold, Batman's rich history allows him to be interpreted in a multitude of ways. To be sure, this is a lighter incarnation, but it's certainly no less valid and true to the character's roots as the tortured Avenger crying out for mommy and daddy. However, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to be focusing on the BTAS version of Bruce Wayne, Kel Supris. The first thing I want to challenge is the idea that Bruce Wayne is a mask. I do agree that Batman is who Bruce Wayne is on the inside and don't dispute that his public persona of Bruce Wayne is an act, another version of himself that he presents to people to avoid suspicion. After all, we all have our public faces and our private faces. Human beings generally don't act the same way in all situations. Most people wouldn't speak to, say, a bank manager in the same way that they would speak to their best friend. Kevin Conroy has previously likened the Batman Bruce Wayne dichotomy to the Scarlet Pimpernel, an early 20th century character whose stories took place during the French Revolution. Sir Percy Blakeney leads a double life, apparently nothing more than a wealthy fop, but in reality a formidable swordsman and a quick-thinking master of disguise and escape artist. Yeah, I can completely see where he's coming from. While Batman does try very hard to make Bruce Wayne seem like an aloof oaf when he's out in public, especially during the early episodes of BTAS, at the same time he doesn't let this persona interrupt the good work he does through Wayne Industries. In the fantasy, hypothetical world, all billionaires use their money for the betterment of the world. They take their wealth and invest it in the communities they operate out of through paying taxes, creating jobs and donating to charitable causes out of the kindness of their hearts. In reality, they hoard their cash, hiding it in offshore accounts to avoid paying the appropriate taxes, or blow their money on inane vanity projects like rocket launches or buying social media platforms and then running them into the ground. They may make charitable donations, but only because they're tax deductible. When the average billionaire pays less tax than you or I, then we know there's a problem. In the DC animated universe, much of this is also true. We see wealthy champions of industry like Ferris Boyle, Roland Daggett and Lex Luthor, who are downright villainous. Their only goals are the accumulation of more money and power. But on the flip side, we have Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne is the exception to this rule, and in a lot of ways he's portrayed as the idealised version of a billionaire. Yes, Bruce Wayne runs a number of very profitable companies, and of course he wants to ensure that they remain successful. But he's not doing it for the sake of hoarding money. He uses Wayne Industries for the betterment of Gotham City, and to enhance his mission as Batman. All those batarangs he keeps tossing at fools don't pay for themselves after all. As we've seen in the episode If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Rich? Bruce negotiates a deal to buy Competitron software from Daniel Mockridge, because of the jobs it'll bring to Gotham City. Well, I mean, I say negotiate, really. He just says that he wants those jobs in Gotham, so he's going to buy the company. Compare Bruce Wayne to Daniel Mockridge, who only cares about getting the best deal he can. Mockridge, whose success was built upon Edward Nigma's work on the Riddle of the Minotaur game, managed to build his wealth by excluding Nigma, denying him a share of the profits. Yes, it was all technically legal because of Nigma's work for higher contract, but it was immoral, and it led to the creation of the Riddler. Mockridge is clearly devoid of any actual creativity, and is entirely dependent on other people for his success. This is perfectly illustrated when the Riddler surprises Mockridge in his office, and the prospect of a new product for him to exploit fills Mockridge's face with glee. Moments before this conversation, he had downplayed Nigma's abilities, but deep down inside he knew Nigma had all the talent. Similarly, following the events of Heart of Ice, Ferris Boyle, the CEO of Gothcorp, was revealed to be a cold-hearted monster that destroyed the lives of Victor and Nora Freeze in the name of Profit. Boyle is particularly pernicious because he publicly presented himself and his company as putting people first. In his appearance on the news talking about the string of break-ins at Gothcorp facilities, he seeks only to help those responsible and resolve any issues they may have. The reality is that Boyle is a heartless liar and only cares about his profits. If Boyle had any foresight at all, he would have seen Freeze's work into cryogenics as a medical game changer. Think how many lives would have been saved if this technology was successful. But instead, all Boyle thought about was his short-term profits and in the process destroyed two lives. You'd have to imagine that a corporate crisis like having your kindly CEO being revealed as a murderer would cause the company's stock price to plummet and potentially put the company out of business. Fortunately, Bruce Wayne became a majority shareholder in Gothcorp, presumably to keep the high-paying jobs in Gotham and for their research 
research into cryogenics to continue. In Sub-Zero, we see Bruce just wander into the Gothcorp labs like he owns the place. I'm thinking about it, actually, he probably does, with no need for an appointment. He could have easily let the company go under and then bought up their assets for pennies on the dollar, but instead he swooped in to keep the company going with as little disruption as possible. Another deceptive industrialist is Roland Daggett arguably one of the most evil characters in the entire series. Daggett presents himself as a strong champion of progress, but in reality he's a lazy, murderous crook. In Feet of Clay, Daggett plots to use corporate espionage to absorb Wayne Industries to get his hands on their marketing department, rather than build one of his own. When evidence of this criminality comes to light, he uses the facially malleable Matt Hagen to impersonate Bruce Wayne to lure Lucius Fox into a trap, gather up the evidence, and then kill him. Batman interrupts their scheme, so Daggett orders Hagen to be killed to cover up his involvement, although this leads to the creation of Clayface, but that's a whole other story. Likewise, in Cat Scratch Fever, Daggett's team of scientists manufacture a virus that can be spread from stray animals to humans, a virus that they have already developed a vaccine for, which they will then sell for huge profits and be hailed as heroes. Finally, in Appointment in Crime Alley, Daggett plans to demolish the Park Row area of Gotham City, colloquially known as Crime Alley, and build a bunch of high-priced condos. When the residents refuse to leave their homes, Daggett has his men plant explosives and pass off the destruction as an accident, which would have killed everyone in the neighborhood and allowed him to swoop in and redevelop the area. Every evil act perpetrated by Roland Daggett is done in the pursuit of wealth. He rarely gets his own hands dirty, but the fact that he pays people to enact these awful crimes makes him just as guilty as his henchmen. We never see Daggett donating to charity or funding good causes. All of his get-rich schemes involve frivolous, unnecessary items. The Renew You face cream is intended for the vain. His vaccine is for a virus that didn't exist until he tried to unleash it on the population. His gaudy condos are completely unnecessary. Daggett doesn't want to put the time and effort into becoming a titan of industry. Instead, he wants to take shortcuts to sell people things they don't need. When he loses his wealth, rather than build himself back up, he chooses to steal a Jade Cat statue, blame it on Catwoman, and break in the money. He really is utterly detestable. Compare these industrialists to Bruce Wayne, whose companies do provide frivolous things like cosmetics and perfume, but he also funds research into supercomputers, cryogenics, pays for free healthcare in Crime Alley, and even funds a halfway house for his rehabilitated foes to stay in while they get back on their feet. Bruce Wayne is a man that isn't afraid to get his hands dirty and put his money where his mouth is. Yes, he does care about being profitable, but he won't compromise his standards in the name of the almighty dollar, as seen in Eternal Youth. I don't care how much money we'll lose. I won't have Wayne Enterprises involved in an operation that destroys a rainforest. Shut it down or you're gone. A lot of Bruce Wayne's good deeds are hidden from the public eye, even if we do ignore everything he does as Batman. For instance, looking at the episode The Forgotten, in which Gotham's homeless are being rounded up and taken to work in a slave camp, Bruce learns about this because of his charitable work at a homeless shelter. He's literally there to help with the groceries and prepare meals. There's no publicity involved. He's not advertising his good deeds. He's just there trying to make things better. The police are aware of what's happening, but because these people are homeless, they are viewed as undesirables, and as such, they don't get the same protections from the police that an ordinary citizen might. Bruce sets it upon himself to solve this mystery and rescue them, but in the process is knocked unconscious and develops amnesia. Now, I really don't like the amnesia trope. It's one of the reasons why this episode is on my worst episode list. But there is one strong redeeming scene. One of the dreams he experiences in his amnesiac state shows Bruce Wayne standing in a desolate area of Gotham, surrounded by disheveled people begging for money. Bruce gladly opens his wallet and hands out money, but before long he becomes overwhelmed by the number of people seeking his help and weeps. This tells us quite a bit about his mindset. He's not crying because he's given away all of his money. He's crying because there are so many people that need his help, and the money isn't going to solve the fundamental problem in society. Now this does mirror a traditional conservative talking point. You shouldn't hand out money to people because they'll become dependent on it and never better themselves. Better to teach a man to fish than to keep handing out fish. But what do you do when there are no fish to catch? The difference between Batman and that conservative talking point is that, in Bruce's case, this is where his mission kicks in. As Batman, he will fight crime, protect the innocent, and ensure that wrongdoers get the appropriate punishment. As Bruce Wayne, he will use his wealth to provide a safety net for Gotham's poorest, and try to improve the living conditions by bringing well-paid jobs to the city. It's a very noble mission, but does it really make a difference? Well, I'd say yes, yes it does, one person at a time. Gotham is supposed to be a city of 10 million people, so I can understand why it might not look like much progress is being made. But really, what more can one man do? I think the most important thing that Batman does is inspire us to be kinder, to offer others a helping hand when they need it, not because it benefits us directly, but because it's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, this kind of billionaire doesn't exist in the real world, and we're all worse off for it.